place in 2005. Oh, <laughs> uh, it took place in 2005, and it is known as the Miracle on the Hudson. And this is when an A320 struck a flock of Canada geese and suffered a complete engine failure. Uh, the pilot said to land the, land the plane on the Hudson River. There were no casualties. And I just have to say this presentation is not meant to instill a fear of flying. Um, catastrophic events like this are extremely rare. Um, and most strikes just result in operational inconveniences and, and very occasionally fairly minor damage to the aircraft. So I'm not trying to scare anybody here. Um, probably the most common issue associated with bird strikes is the financial loss. So if an aircraft is damaged and it does need to return, you can imagine that all these passengers need to be rerouted and then the costs associated with this will add up very quickly. Sometimes they need to bring a new plane over from wherever that plane was originally headed. And um, yeah, it can just cost so much money just to reroute passengers. Um, but even a basically zero risk bird strike, such as a barn swallow strike, which basically cannot damage a plane, um, it can cause delays. So. Anytime there's a bird strike or a wildlife strike, the runways need to be inspected before they can be used again. Uh, so this causes delays, uh, possibly even rejected landings, and this will mean more delays for passengers and more fuel expenditures. So YBR has a program to avoid all of these headaches, or at least try to reduce the risk. Um, and so a little overview of the program, uh, it's divided into three sections. So we have the core services, which is provided by a company called Avisher, and they are there 24-7. Um, they generally do a lot of hazing, so they use pyrotechnics, stock whips, trained dogs. Uh, you can see a couple of dogs in that photo there. Uh, they use boats, and uh, occasionally they do have to use lethal control but it's pretty rare. Um, and then there's the falconry team and they, that is performed by Pacific Northwest Raptors um, and they fly natural predators in the area to deter prey species from using the space. So um, typically they fly eagles, um, hawks, peregrine falcons, um, and they deter ducks, geese, shorebirds, and gulls. And I've been really lucky to be part of this team as well for a number of years, so. Um, and then the third section is me. Uh, I'm an Adam BC and I manage the raptor trapping and translocation program, uh, which is what this presentation is focused on. Um, so one of the most common questions is how I got into this. Um, Elizabeth gave me a great intro, so I don't need to get too into it, um, but raptor husbandry is sort of where I started and uh, raptor research is definitely my passion. I'm very passionate about conservation. Um, and I met Bud Anderson, uh, who used to work at Seattle Tacoma Airport until very recently, he retired. Um, and he was a great mentor to me. And he convinced Gary Searing, who some of you have probably met, um, he used to manage the raptor trapping and translocation program at YBR. Um, and Bud convinced Gary that he should hire me. So um, I'm very grateful to both of them for their mentorship. And when Gary retired in 2019, I was able to take over his program. Just in time for COVID-19 to hit. <laughs> um, so you might be wondering why a raptor specific program exists while there are hazard more hazardous species. So um, there's a few reasons. And one of them is that raptors have a relatively high biomass and tend to hunt in the infields among taxiways and runways. So they do pose a significant risk despite not being the highest uh, risk group. Um, conservation is also a priority. We would like to coexist with the raptors and not simply remove them. Um, we are habitat to some species at risk. Uh, that includes barn owls and short-eared owls, so we don't want to just eliminate them. We want to find ways to coexist. Um, and 
one of a really great reason is that it is possible to manage these birds at an individual level, which we'll learn a little bit more about soon. Um, so we can treat each hawk, for example, as an individual with, diff with unique behaviors, whereas if you have a flock of snow geese, it's impossible to do that. Um, and then there are programs designated to some other species such as snow geese, so there are extra shifts added in the winter to help manage the geese specifically. Um, so all of, all of the teams that operate airside are constantly uh, assessing risk and prioritizing effort, and it depends on the imminent hazards, um, which are influenced by environmental factors. Um, so we use a hazard matrix, but it's really a moving target. So an example of this is a flock of Dunlin, which you can see in the top left corner there. While they're not generally a dangerous bird, um, in pretty adverse weather conditions, they do like to rest on our crosswind runway. Um, so that also coincides with when we need our crosswind runway. And so it's not going to be terribly dangerous for aircraft to use that space, but we will definitely be hitting shorebirds, which we don't want to do from a conservation approach, but also it will be an operational nightmare because you do need to get the sweeper out and then you have to worry about birds scavenging on their carcasses and it's a disaster. <laughs> um, and then you have something like snow geese, which are of course high consequence bird, they're very large and they flock. So they're more in the orange red part of the matrix. Um, and they have something like a barn swallow, which is basically in the green. It's just difficult um, to manage and very low risk, but operationally challenging. And we don't wanna hurt barn, barn swallows either. Um, but even small birds can cause a lot of damage. Um, so this is a picture of a 747, um, which is an enormous jet. They have four engines. And uh, this is the aftermath of a strike with the Eurasian kestrel. So not an American kestrel that you see here, but a very similar species. Um, so a, a Eurasian kestrel was ingested into one of the engines and the plane was on takeoff and at the last second, uh, the pilot decided to abort takeoff. Now they were past the speed of V1, which is supposed to be the point of no return, but the pilots chose to abort takeoff and they slammed on the brakes. And as the plane was taxiing off the runway, it broke into four pieces. Um, so there were no injuries as it was a cargo plane and it broke where the cargo hold was. Um, but it just demonstrates that even a low risk strike, there is still a human element to it. And sometimes those mistakes can compound and cause pretty big problems as you can see here. So here are the species of raptors that we most commonly deal with uh, year round. So here are the year round ones. We have red tailed hawks. Uh, we have local breeding pairs who breed on Sea Island. Um, and they bring their young airside soon after fledging. Um, and they learn to hunt in our grassy meadows. Uh, we also have wintering residents and transients. And August and September tends to be the busiest month uh, for trapping red-tailed hawks as they're mostly uh, dispersing hatchier birds and they, they end up in an urban area and then they just get pushed into this green oasis uh, within the city in environment. Um, and then we get barn owls year round as well. Uh, we typically capture between 40 and up to 100 barn owls a year. Uh, their population is quite healthy in our area, but that's not the case across Canada. So they're still a species to protect. Um, our kestrel population is doing quite well. Um, it's been steadily growing over the years. Um, 2020 was actually a record year for captures. Um, and it's pretty nice to see that they're doing so well, because again, they're not doing well everywhere in North America. We capture a lot of Cooper's hawks. Um, they're definitely not what we target, but they love our goshawk traps, and there's just a lot of them in the area. Um, they don't typically get struck by aircraft, mostly because of their behavior and flying style, but they end up in our traps, <laughs> so we get to see a lot of them. And then there's 
a list of some of the other raptors that we encounter. So bald eagles, um, they are year round, but their populations fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, Northern Harrier, they breed north of our airfield as well. Uh, we capture peregrine falcons, the occasional sharp-shinned hawk, uh, several merlins a year, occasionally a barred owl, and a few great horned owls every year. And then here are our wintering species. Um, so rough-legged hawks can be a challenge to manage. Um, they migrate down, they arrive usually early to mid-October, so we have them now. Um, and they are a challenge in their behavior um, and they tend to be readily struck. So one difficulty that is pretty unique to this species is their tendency to uh, hover while they're hunting. Quite, they, they do it fairly consistently regardless of wind conditions. Um, so this means they'll be facing into the wind with their back to aircraft because the aircraft is also taking off and landing into the wind. <laughs> So the birds may not be paying attention to the aircrafts and they might not be using their avoidant behaviors to avoid being hit by aircraft. So they can be quite hazardous in that way. Uh, they also spend a decent amount of time on the ground, uh, more so than red tails. And so they can be difficult to observe from a wildlife technician perspective. They might not see them near a runway or a taxiway. Um, and even from a trapping perspective, it's, it's difficult for me to have eyes everywhere. And snowy owls, um, we had a pretty busy uh, year last year for snowy owls, um, and they're very difficult to trap in this environment. There are thousands of an American widgeon all over the airfield, all around the airfield, so they have a lot of prey and to take the risk of going into a trap that doesn't look quite right, it's really difficult to convince them to do so. And um, it's also very difficult to get their attention when there are thousands of ducks uh, around them. We also get short-eared owls. They tend to stay around the marshlands, but they in the evenings and early mornings, we do see them airside quite a bit. And then we get the occasional deer falcon, but it's, it's pretty rare. Uh, we usually, band maybe one a year, but probably maybe only every other year. So here's a, a visualization of uh, the species breakdown that we deal with. Sorry about the formatting there for some of the, the lower percentage species, um, but you can see barn owls are over a third of our species that we catch. Red-tailed hawks are a quarter, um, and then Cooper's hawks are number three and then everything else is a little bit lower. And as I said, American kestrels are on the rise. So here are some of the traps that we use. These are the most common traps that I use, um, but there are more. Um, so the first one is the Swedish goshawk trap. So I was, I tried to use photos that I took of my traps, but these ones are a lot more clear to be understand to understand the mechanisms behind the traps. So the first one, the Swedish goshawk trap, the bird comes in and lands on a trigger bar that is holding those spring-loaded doors open. So when they land on that trigger bar, it closes around the bird. So it's a pretty passive trap. You don't have to be monitoring it all the time. Uh, it's really great for barn owls. And, red, and young red-tailed hawks, especially. The Balshatri trap is the middle one and it is a more active trap. So I need to be with it all the time. Um, I tend to do a lot of roadside trapping with this. So I drive by a bird casually and throw the trap out my door. Um, typically I bait it with a mouse, but sometimes I use a starling. And so the bird will go in to try and catch that prey but instead they'll get their feet caught on the nooses that are uh, fishing line. And then the bonnet. Um, this is great for more difficult birds, um, birds that are a little more wary of more obvious traps and they can be baited with starling, pigeon um, or a rodent. And I have a video of my remote control bonnet in use and you can see how discreet it is. Um, the problem is it takes 
a few minutes to set it up. So you need to really observe the bird's habits and have it set up before they arrive so they're not suspicious. So it's quite discreet. I really love this trap. Um, I have another one that's smaller and uh, it's really great for kestrels as well. So all birds that are captured are marked with government issued bands, those metal bands you'll see on that barn owl foot. Um, and then uh, the Budios and the Eagles will get patagial tags. So those are those white tags with the alphanumeric codes. Um, so using these tags allows us to manage the birds at an individual level, as well as demonstrate that the program is working and that translocation is safe and effective uh, in an environment like an airport. So many, many airports actually use lethal control to manage their raptors, um, but Vancouver, Portland, and Seattle, uh, we're, we're really trying to demonstrate through data and through collecting the, the movement ecology data of these tagged birds that we can manage raptors safely without lethally removing them. And not only is it effective, but it might actually be safer than just obliterating the population. Mm. So here are the translocation drop-off spots. Um, the main ones are in Chilliwack within that blue circle there. So most of our species go there, um, except for in terrible, terribly cold winter conditions. Uh, we, don't, we don't send the little owls out there. We don't send barn owls or shorty owls if it's too cold. Um, but in decent weather, so most of the year, we chose spots where there's quite a few old barns so that they may be able to set up shop there and start breeding out there as well. Um, and so that includes north and south of the border. We don't drive them across the border, but we do expect for them to cross no problem and go into some of those nice old barns. And the location near Boundary Bay is good for Again, those owls in the winter, especially the short-eared owls, there's some great habitat, great mar marsh habitat that they love. Um, and we also take some Northern Harriers there as well. So we'll talk a little bit about the reciting data. Now here are some reciting points. Um, so all of these red dots might represent tens or hundreds of points. Um, so it doesn't look like we have many sightings, but we have thousands of sightings reported. Um, but I just showed, up, showed this zoomed out version because it's quite interesting to see where they end up, um, especially those ones that end up in Montana. Um, we had one up in Juneau, Alaska, which is pretty amazing. Um, and I had an interesting one quite recently, actually. I think it was in September. Um, we translocated a young red-tailed hawk out to Chilliwack and within two weeks she was on Vancouver Island. So I don't know if YVR was just a stop in on her way to, uh, to the island originally and we took her off route and she ended there anyways, but uh, it's pretty remarkable um, how much they get around. Yeah. And we also get quite a few reports uh, in and around Seattle and Portland. Uh, especially because they have substantial raptor trapping and translocation programs at their airports as well. Um, so the word has gotten out and so they, they, citizens tend to be familiar with the programs. So we really rely on citizen science here. The data is so important. It does help us prove to our airport, but other airports that this program is working and that these birds not only survive where we send them, um, they do tend to stay away from our airport for the most part. Um, now, we do have local resident hawks and we do like them. We want them to stay. So here are some of our hawks and their territory. So all of these polygons are associated with a tagged bird. Um, so some of these birds are 10 to 12 or more years old and they do maintain their territories on the airfield. They establish the territories that are typically avoidant of dangerous areas. 
uh, and they have been observed to defend these territories, which could help keep the transients out. Now, the territories are generally filled quickly once a bird has disappeared. It's quite unusual for them to be struck by an aircraft. Um, I do sometimes get reports of them being discovered hit by a car or dying of natural causes. Um, but the territories that you see here have also somewhat been shaped through hazing. So the airside wildlife staff will monitor the birds and they input the observed locations of the birds regularly. And from there, we establish their preferred habitat and we shape the polygon to exclude certain areas, particularly crossing the runways. So I'll give you an example of this on the next slide. So Mike three, uh, this is one of my favorite hawks. Um, she's a female red-tailed hawk that was captured as a second year bird in 2012. Um, she spends most of her time around the airside operations building, which is difficult to see on the map, but it's, it's a building very close to where the densest blue points are. Um, so YVR staff regularly watch her outside their, <laughs> their windows from their desk. Um, and there are green spaces in and around the building and the long angled taxiway hotel there. Um, so you might, you'll notice that she's got her, her polygon there and that there are two observations outside of the polygon. So we don't want her north of that north runway um, because she could cross an, an, at a bad time. This is possible uh, despite we, we assume that they have some of her behavior, but it is possible that she gets distracted and she makes a mistake. So these two observation points, I hope they're associated also with a hazing effort. So a wildlife te technician might have noticed her outside of her polygon and they might have pushed her back through a gentle hazing. She's usually pretty quick to move. Um, and then we can keep that ideal habitat uh, ideal habitat shape um, just by allowing her to hunt freely and successfully and without being hazed. So here are some of our results. I'll try to keep um, this pretty light. Uh, the, I'll show a few species and the data because I think it's interesting. Um, so the program got started in 2012 um, and really got established in 2014. So you'll see that our strikes were fairly high for red-tailed hawks. We had 11 each year for 2012 to 2013, and they've steadily decreased since then. Um, 2019 is a year that the strikes were a little bit higher than expected, um, but this was also a rec record capture year. Um, so this indicates that we had a generally high population of red-tailed hawks in the area. And it was also our all-time busiest year for air traffic to date, um, including the last two years, of course, because of COVID-19, we still have not recovered. Um, our air travel is still catching up. So it was a bit of a perfect storm there. We had a lot of red tails and a lot of air traffic, um, but we did successfully re remove uh, a record number. I think it was 67 or so, or even more maybe. Um, now, another vari variable that affects especially red-tailed hawks is the Townsend bull population. So twice a year, we conduct small mammal trapping. Um, so for many raptors, this is the most common prey that they go after. Um, and 2019, which is the highest red tail strike year, is also a very high year for bull availability. Now you'll notice that 2016 to 2017, the bull population crashed. Um, this is very typical of small mammal populations. They tend to go through cycles of three to four years. Uh, their population will crash. Um, so this might explain some of our variability in our our hawk uh, behavior and populations. Oh, and uh, small mammal trapping was not conducted in 2020 because of COVID-19, 
budget restrictions, unfortunately, but we do believe that the population was quite low during that time based on raptor behavior, uh, great blue heron behavior, and just observing the airfield. Uh, they tend to make very obvious sort of tracks through the grass and they have lots of burrows and we weren't seeing much of that at all. Mm. So here's an overlay of the small mammal population um, and it corresponds pretty, pretty well with the number of red tails um, and hopefully with more time and more data we'll be able to see a strong correlation uh, between prey availability and uh, red-tailed hawk populations. Now this is great for um, resource allocation. So if we can predict um, when we may have a high number of red-tailed hawks or a high number of great blue herons hunting airside, we'll be able to allocate resources to help manage those populations. Now rough-legged hawks are a little bit different. <laughs> This graph I just think is interesting because our strikes and our captures don't seem to coincide with each other very much at all. Um, so especially if you look at 2017, we had high number of box in the area. We captured a record number, um, yet we, we only hit two. Um, I would guess that this has to do with low prey availability and so that they were very, very desperate and were easily captured because they were so hungry. That would be my guess. Um, and it would also suggest that 2017 was likely a productive breeding year in their breeding territory up north. And so that, and a lot of those birds that were captured in 2017 were hatch year birds. And I did mention that American kestrel numbers were steadily increasing. So this graph really shows that. Um, like I said, 2020 was a record year. Um, and this year in 2022, we didn't quite hit our record, but we're still higher than 2021. Um, and I mean that for captures, not for strikes. Our strikes are still quite low, knock on wood. So it's really nice to see that their population is doing so well here. And um, they are a little bit difficult to capture in the summer months when macro invertebrates are around. Um, I think that dragonflies and grasshoppers are just a much easier target for them and there's low risk associated with those prey items. So another part of our program is nestling banding. So in the spring, we access the local nests around Sea Island. Um, the, for the red tail, oh, sorry, are you trying to get my attention? Oh, I, I sorry, I keep hear, hearing someone. Um, for red tailed hawks, we give them a uh, metal. Yeah, sorry, I have uh, I'll turn off your microphone. Uh, for red-tailed hawks, we give the nestlings a metal government ban, and this allows us to know Sorry. how many of our captured red-tailed hawks have been raised in the area. So if we capture them later on, we know where they came from. Um, and for the bald eagles, we ban them and deploy patagial tags on the nestlings. So deploying the tags has been very interesting as it has allowed us to see how transient they are. Uh, they may be at YVR for a few days, of the year at most. And typically our locally fledged bald eagles are not a big issue to us at all. So we have three bald eagle nests very close to YBR. They're on Sea Island. Two of them are in Iona. And uh, knowing the risks that these nests do present to the airport or do not present to the airport is valuable information from a safety as well as the conservation perspective. And uh, we, or especially me, I like to collaborate with um, other groups. Like I said, research is a, passionate, a passion of mine. Um, so I would like to contribute to research as much as possible on a bigger scale. Um, so one of the projects that I participated in was with Environment Canada. Um, some of you might know Miles Lamont, he's in that photo, and Say Lee. Um, 
so we collaborated when uh, the arborist came to nest or access the nest on Sea Island. Um, I banded and tagged them, and then Sandy and Miles took blood. Now, this was part of a toxicology assessment. It was uh, to measure contaminants such as legacy persistent organic pollutants, um, organochlorines, uh, newer persistent organic pollutants such as flame retardants, uh, metals, they're checking for metals such as mercury, as well as evaluating the eagle's immune system. Um, and this was part of a larger project with multiple partners uh, within Environment Canada and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, it's a project in relation to conservation efforts so the Southern Resident Killer Whale through the Whales Initiative. So bald eagles are an apex predator with an overlap in prey to killer whales. Um, so they're being used as an indicator species to help determine the contaminant exposure. Um, and so they also have an um, uh, air tester, or sorry, um, yeah, oh yeah, a con air contaminant tester in Iona. So they're measuring the contaminants in the air as well as sediment and water in Iona and comparing it to what they find in the nestlings. And another project that we are trying to collaborate with uh, is the Rough Legged Hawk project. Um, now it's with the University of Idaho and we will be deploying transmitters on the rough legged hawks that we capture and we'll be able to contribute to this project that is based on uh, studying the movement ecology of rough legged hawks in North America. So that's pretty exciting. We've been trying to do it for a couple of years, but with the borders being closed, it's been very difficult to get transmitters back and forth very quickly. So that's it for now. If there's any questions, uh, I believe there's time for questions. I'm not exactly sure what your schedule is, but otherwise, thank you so much for coming and uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And yeah, it was nice to meet all of you. Thank you so much, Christine. That was very interesting. Um, it has been an awful long time since uh, we had a presentation on this. And it's, it's interesting how much conservation uh, you're into as, along with the, um, obviously for mitigating the problems um what's going on here this meeting is being recorded yes okay mm -hmm. uh, i don't want to be screen there we go <laughs> here we go <laughs> so i'm not quite sure what happened there um i don't know if anybody has questions but i think um that jeff Cohn answered somebody's questions about the um, White Rock Surrey things. The next one is November 10th, a presentation by Dan Barland on turkey vultures. Love it, second sight. Oh dear. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> I think love at first sight with the turkey vulture would be a little bit difficult, but <laughs> I'm sure they're wonderful creatures with <laughs> play their play and play their part anyway there's a whole he's got a whole lot of information here but um i'll try to remember um mark dalton usually sends me information on uh, your, your programs and i'll pass those out to our members i think somewhere on here you did say that your meetings are going to be held on zoom until further notice on the second thursday of the month and they're at seven o'clock <laughs> and September through June, the same as ours. So I'll try to uh, make sure that our members are aware of what's coming up at, with your shop too. So does anyone have questions for Christine or comments? I see Jim's got his hand up. Hi there. What are the mitigations the airlines or the aircraft manufacturers do to make them less susceptible to uh, strikes? Uh, I, are the engines made more robust? I remember they used to test engines by shooting uh, frozen turkeys at them, but that was too dangerous. So they switched to so unfrozen turkeys. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've actually heard that as well. I'm, 
unfortunately, I'm not that familiar with um, new mitigation that that they put effort into. Um, they there's actually a big disconnect between uh, bird strike um, biologists and airlines pilots, Transport Canada, and we. Bird Strike Canada is an organization that's trying to change that and have more collaboration and more education between the groups. Um, but right now there's a lot of, I, I don't know what the word is. Um, I think that until something really bad happens, a lot of people don't think it's a big deal. Um, maybe the pilots know it's a big, it can be a big deal, but generally speaking, it, it doesn't really affect them all that much on an individual level. And so there's not a whole lot of conversation that should be happening or a collaboration that should be happening. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that I don't know that is happening, but um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know of much that's actually being um, put on aircraft. I know that there's been research done by engineers looking into different lights, um, ultraviolet lights, um, and maybe even sounds emitted from the aircraft um, or the runways to deter birds. But all of that research that I've heard about has not yet been deployed on aircrafts. How about grids in front of the engine? I thought about that too. I don't know why there isn't. <laughs> I imagine it's it has to do with airflow, um, and maybe they don't want a lot of debris captured on those throughout the flight. But I, I also have had that same question. I'm not sure why those don't exist. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. The Audrey's posted a comment here. She's saying very interesting, especially the efforts for conservation of the species, and she's thanking you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I mean, that's definitely what I'm motivated by conservation and helping the birds. Um, whereas I'm sure the money from the airport is in part conservation, but also safety, mostly safety. <laughs> um, but I like keeping the birds safe too. So it, it, it's a win win. Well, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have a, a couple questions, if you don't mind. Um, going back to the relocation uh, and the, the refining of the birds. What bird made its way to Juneau? Um, it was a red-tailed hawk and it was before I managed the program, um, right. but Gary got that report. Um, it's a long way. It is a very long way. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, I could get you the history uh, of that eventually, but I, I don't have it on hand. I'd have to go through my database. So are those, those reports, are those um, being retrapped or are they visual on a, on a band or how does that work? They're the visual patagial tags. So the, the map that I showed were only patagial tag resightings. Um, I didn't include the band recaptures. I'm not familiar with that word you used. What kind of tag? Uh, the, the wing tag, the patagial tag. Got it. Yeah, okay. Those white tags of the alphanumeric code. Oh, so you can see it from a long ways away. Yeah, yeah. Got it, right. Yeah. And, hey, and the captures that you had, um, are those unique birds? Or are those one bird sometimes being captured a second time? Or, you know, in the graphs you had of the strikes and captures, are all each of those captures? Those are all individual first capture birds. Yeah, they're not recaptures. Those are excluded. And there aren't that many recaptures, especially with red-tailed hawks. Um, Cooper's hawks get recaptured a little bit and barn owls a little bit, but uh, yeah, those graphs excluded those. Debbie has a question. Let's talk at it. Hi, uh, Christine. When you release your birds into Boundary Bay and Chilliwack area, do you do it? carrying capacity assessment. I've seen a lot of harriers uh, in Boundary Bay and they almost become like aggressive, not aggressive, but as you mentioned, the territory. So I'm curious as to how you decide where to release what species. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, especially in an area like Boundary Bay that is a, a bit of a geographic geographical bottleneck, I guess. Um, with 
Harriers, the reality is we don't catch very many. Um, we capture maybe two a year, maybe. Um, if we were capturing, you know, 10, 20, 30 a year, it might, it might be an issue, but uh, we, we don't have a limit to how many birds that we can move. Um, we are regulated or my permit is regulated by the province and I do have to report to them. And so they can decide um, with their policies, which birds I can move and when. And so I let them know how many birds I have moved and they give me the green light. Um, and as for, yeah, short eared owls go there as well. And once again, we don't capture all that many. So I don't think that the population um, is too great in those in those areas. Um, and harriers are extremely aggressive at YVR as well. Um, when I try to capture basically any other species and they're interested in my trap, I get a harrier coming in dive bombing that bird I'm after and it distracts that bird and it makes my life very difficult. So um, they are, they're pretty aggressive for being such a a small bird. They're only about, you know, 400 grams. <laughs> but that's a great question. Um, and I'm sure if it, if uh, the habitat did become too full, or if I was moving too many birds there, uh, the province would help guide that decision with me. Paul has a question. Yeah, you know, prior to this talk, talk, I always assumed it was the non-raptor birds that were the problem, you know, that they would be the ones that would fly into the planes and all that, and that raptors were purposely kept around airports to discourage the, the like, the other birds. But that's obviously not the case. Now, do you, do you get many of the other birds running into airplanes? Yeah, we do, definitely. Um, raptors are not the most struck bird. Um, that's just what I focus on. And um, we, snow geese are a huge problem um, and gulls are a very big problem as well. They tend to be struck fairly regularly and they're quite large birds. So they're definitely higher on the hazard matrix because they're more likely to occur than a raptor strike. So um, Abisher, those core service providers, that I mentioned earlier, they tend to deal with those birds more than I do. Um, and then shorebirds are another bird that gets struck quite often, especially on um, windy, wet days. They are very commonly struck. So um, all the birds are, are a hazard. Any bird on the airfield is a hazard and it's just managing those birds. And because we can manage raptors at an individual level that we can keep some of them around. And as you say, Sometimes you, you do want some raptors around. It's, it's good. Um, our territorial red tails, I regularly do watch them keep youngsters out who have less experience. And it has been shown in the literature that it is, they are the young birds that, that tend to get struck more often, whether that's by an aircraft or a vehicle or even window strikes. The literature shows that those, those young birds are they're taking more risk and they don't have those avoidant behaviors developed quite the way that adults do. So yes, well, well, what, we don't want them, but we want some of them. <laughs> yeah, what proportion would you say were <clears throat> raptors that were a part of the strike versus other birds? Uh, I don't have that data on me right now. Um, the database is huge and it's often measured by biomass rather than individual. And um, I don't have the proportion, but I think gulls are the highest struck at YVR um, by biomass. Um, I think um, geese might be, or no, ducks are probably next. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the actual proportions by biomass. Jim, I see you have a question, but you have to. Take your mute off. You're muted, Jim. Uh, okay. Yeah. Does the pilot have to abort his flight even though the bird has not struck an engine? 
No, and even if the bird does strike an engine, he, he or she does not have to abort takeoff. It's up to their discretion. Um, and sometimes they will take off and then decide once they're in the air that they need to come back um, or they may just continue. Um, it's, it's totally up to their discretion. Thank you. Brian? Um, but you do have to by law report bird strikes um, as a pilot. So you have to report that you struck it, but you don't have to take any further action. Um, the ground crew at your destination will likely take a blood sample for DNA testing to determine what species was struck. Brian. Yeah, I was uh, quite interested to hear you say that there was a busy year last year for snow owls. I'm a bird watcher, as many of people here, and we're talking to people and watching reports, and there was only a few last year. Do you saw more than that? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was quite unfortunate. The, the birds that were around were being harassed by eagles, but also by photographers in Iona. Um, and it was my impression that they were just exhausted. And anytime they tried to leave the vicinity of the airport and go to Iona, they were harassed back almost immediately by photographers. Um, so that was really challenging to see, especially when one did get struck by an aircraft. So um, yeah, we had at least six individuals just at YBR last year. Wow. Um. That's terrible to hear. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize that there were so many last year because we didn't see too many around here, but um, that problem with photographers harassing birds is something that we've experienced uh, here uh, particularly yeah. at Brunswick Point. And, you know, we actually last year, thanks to Anne, and I'm not sure if she's still with us, um, and a few other people uh, put together um, a pamphlet that could be handed out on the dikes Oh, nice. You know, talking about the dangers of harassing owls in particular. Um, yeah, then, that's great. And we had to do another one on garter snakes because people were oh. harassing them too. But yeah. The, but not the <laughs> photographers, obviously that was kids, but the photographer problem is it, it's very bad. I mean, they just don't yeah. realize that those poor birds, you know, they're trying to take photos of are exhausted and hungry and need mm -hmm. to be left alone. And driving them into a plane is a really bad, bad thing. I don't think I was aware that that happened. Yeah, I I tried not to advertise it um, because I didn't want to draw more photographers in. Um, but a pamphlet would be great to hand directly to the people that are the problem for sure. Um, another thing that the snowy owls suffer from in this area is um, asper. So a lot of them are affected by asper in the area, and any of the ones that we have. Um, dissected, um, they've been suffering from it. So it's a fungal infection in their lungs and it can spread into their kidneys and um, their air sacs. And, um, and so they're already in trouble. I was speaking to Ildiko, who's the curator at the BD Biodiversity Museum at UBC. And she said any specimen that she's received from the lower mainland, those owls, snowy owls, they have been infected, so including the one that we struck this year and another one that was found dead on the airfield. And there was one more specimen. It must have also, oh, eagles killed it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, mm -hmm. they, uh, they're, they're having a hard time when they come down here. So it's, it's good to educate photographers. Yeah, I'll send you the, um, the link to, we've got, it's on our website. Um, I don't, I don't think that we actually have any printed copies of that thing at the moment because it was done with the wildlife management area people and they were supposed to be printing it. And I don't know that they ever have actually given Delta Natural Society copies of the, of the <laughs> that we that we created. So, but I'll send you the link to it on the website because it's, it's something that, that may help if it can be yeah. handed out. 
to photographers in the area just to, to make them aware that this is a really, you know, harassing birds in order to get really good photos just isn't on. Yeah, that would be great. Help with the language to use and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Jim? Is the yeah. owl's disease, Astra, as you mentioned, is that the same one that the bad populations are suffering from with a white nose? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Um, I don't, the white nose, uh, what is the white nose? So it's at, like the, the bird one is quite common in Arctic species. It's aspergillosis. Um, or Asper. I can look up quickly what white nose is. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe white nose only affects bats, but um, I don't know. I don't. Oh. It doesn't seem to be the same, but they're both, they're both they're both bubbling. Do all yeah. catch bats? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if snowy owl is good. Snowy owls are pretty slow to make decisions in, <laughs> in my experience. <laughs> it's kind of rare for a, a, a virus to infect different species and different uh, whole gender of species like uh, mammals versus birds and so forth. Mm -hmm. This is a fungus though. Um, but well, even a fungus, though, usually has a narrow host. Yeah, I have caught uh, I have caught a a disease, a respiratory illness from falcons, though, so it is possible. <laughs> That's interesting. It was okay. bacteria. Interesting. <laughs> it, yeah, I I was surprised. So I was quarantined with the falcons. I was the only one allowed to feed them. This was back in my zoo keeping days. <laughs> Good heavens. Not quite the word. Those things could pass like that. Anyone else have questions or comments? No? I guess, oh, one, I mean, related to disease and conservation that I meant to mention mm -hmm. is that YVR is um, putting in some great efforts with um, avian influenza. So any chance we get, we're sending in samples to Canadian Wildlife Services so that we can get a better idea of what's going on in the environment. So that's, that's pretty cool. My, my final question, if I may, is uh, how big a problem are bird strikes on, in airplanes? I mean, you mentioned the one where Sully, you know, there's a movie on the Hudson River, but mm -hmm. you don't hear of it very often. I'm sure it occurs, but how big a problem is it? Um, like I said, it's mostly associated with the financial burden of it right. associated with operations and sometimes damage to aircraft. It's, it's pretty rare to have anything catastrophic happen. I've never, I've been at the airport for 10 years and I've never witnessed anything scary at all. I've witnessed um, a bird being ingested in an engine and the pilot put it, slamming the brakes and popping all the tires. So just because of the heat. And so that plane had to be on the runway for hours and had to be lifted off and all those people had to be rerouted and they had to bring a new plane over and so that was probably the worst thing I've seen um, there was a fatality a few years ago in British Columbia um, associated with the snowbirds um, and it was because of a bird strike uh, however they, the problem was the seat didn't eject properly from the aircraft. So the pilot ejected and there was an issue with that. So uh, they, can be, they can be dangerous for sure. It's extremely rare, um, but those small military aircraft um, are definitely more at risk than a commercial aircraft, so. Um, I'd like to just circle back to those polygons you had for the different birds. I didn't mm -hmm. make sure I understood that. So if you find a bird outside its kind of home range, that's when you apply an extra management uh, procedure. Is that the idea there? Yeah. So those polygons, that map is something that I 
I drew up for the wildlife technicians that are out there. So if they see, like I said, Mike three, she's outside of her polygon north of the runway. Um, she She's more at risk of crossing the runway back to her territory at an inopportune time. So we would like to watch for aircraft and then just bump her. Just usually just human presence is enough. Sometimes pointing at the bird is great. Um, or pyrotechnics if it needs to happen really fast. Um, because it's not only that she might cross casually, it could be that she's now in another bird's territory. And then sometimes if they get into a squabble, they're not paying attention, they start fighting over the runway and then they, they're more at risk that way too. So we try to keep the chaos low and everybody in their homes. So of course she crosses, when we're not seeing, she roosts north of the airfield at night. So she is crossing the airfield at least twice a day. She's, you know, to, to get to a roosting site um, and she breeds north of the airfield as well. So it's not that she's, she never leaves that area, but that's just where she stays during the daytime. So. Okay, any more questions? Elizabeth? Our means waving her hand there. Well, it's not a question. I've been dying to share a, a close encounter with a red tail hawk story. Um, last year, um, we live in Twasden, a beach grove area where, and our house is surrounded by mainly cedars. We have a small pond by our deck. And uh, I was out on the deck and I heard this, uh, a bird screeching and screeching and screeching like it was really upset. And, and I, caught glimpses of it flying from one tree to another around the backyard. And next thing I knew, it flew down and landed on a, uh, one of our cedar lawn chairs on the back of it, uh, 10 feet from me. So uh, I sit, managed to get Jim's attention through his office window. And he was going to get a camera. And so uh, it would glance over at me now and then, and then it would look back at our picture windows and um, to overlook the deck. So uh, then I sat down in a chair and he'd look at me now and then and I'd call and say, you're very welcome to come here. Happy to have, see you. <laughs> and he'd turn around like, who cares? And uh, look at this window again. And I finally figured out that um, maybe he thought he's seeing another red tailed hawk in the reflection of the window. He was about 12 feet away from it. And so Jim, Jim came in with his camera to take a picture through the window. And I think he saw his movement and he took off. So uh, I went to Google and uh, looked up on uh, red tail hawks. And apparently um, one day the mother just disappears. And the, uh, the, uh, little, the young uh, red tail hawks are kind of freaked out about this. And that was what was happening with it. He was looking for mom or her brother, sister, whatever. And then I think he was seeing himself and thinking, well, is that my brother? Is that mom? <laughs> I don't know. That's my supposition. But um, it was uh, unique to be sitting there for eight, seven or eight minutes with this red tail hawk uh, 10 feet away from me. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. It's yeah. very cool encounter. Yeah, really neat. Yes. Okay, well, if that's it for questions, then I will just say thank you again, Christine. I uh, really appreciate the effort you put into uh, getting the presentation ready, and it was very interesting. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure everybody else did too, and I see Paul's yes. clapping there. Thank you. <laughs> and, it was great. Uh, our next meeting uh, is December the 6th. Uh, once again, we'll be doing uh, 